Nvidia promised 2x the performance, but that wasn't enough to stop everyone from reeling at the $1,600 price tag of the RTX 4090 from Nvidia's new Ada Lovelace generation of graphics cards. I'm here to tell you that $1,600 is actually a great deal for the 4090, despite being $100 more than the Founders Edition 3090 MSRP, though $300 less than I paid for my RTX RTV 90. But it's not because of the 2X gaming performance, which in my limited testing does ring true, as seen here in Cyberpunk 2077, the Lyra Unreal Engine 5 demo, and with DLSS 3 providing even more incredible results over last generation. 3D Mark, similar story. Nah, I'll, I'll let you watch other channels for that one. We're going to talk about why it's a great deal for all of this. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my own streaming platform, Nebula, and see my documentary series, Print Screen, premiering on November 14th, bundled with CuriosityStream at the link below. It's easy to point out a card like the 4090 and say that it's too expensive for gaming. In fact, seemingly everyone did this back when the 90 class of cards were kept completely separate from Nvidia's gaming brand. These are the Titan cards. Every year, everyone seemed to be in agreement that they do, while they, while they do have some performance increases, that they were too expensive and overkill for gaming, and that most people shouldn't buy them. And yet, every year, people kept doing it anyway, even SLIing them sometimes, and all the tech channels saying to not buy them for gaming kept testing and showcasing them for gaming and using them in their gaming. PC builds every year. Prior to getting my RTX Titan, I was super frustrated at the complete lack of coverage of the T-Rex for actual work use cases, especially when everyone kept insisting that they weren't cards for gaming, and yet that's all the channels wanted to cover. Of course, Nvidia saw that Titans were being bought up like crazy for gaming and decided to loop them back into the GeForce branding. Seems pretty obvious. The Titan drivers were basically the same as GeForce drivers anyway, and with the new studio driver track that they introduced in like 2018-ish, the Titan drivers were made redundant anyway. Instead of an Ampere-based Titan, they released the GeForce RTX 3090. Is Nvidia to blame for branding it for gaming and confusing the messaging? Of course. But of course they were going to do that if that's where the cards were going to anyway. Now that doesn't account for the prices of the 4080 and the 4070 with the 7 turned into an 8, and I don't see how Intel can offer 16 gigabyte cards for under $400 and Nvidia's cards are still so RAM limited under the 90 tier. I can't explain that one. But the RTX 4090 is an absolute workhorse of a graphics card. 24 gigabytes of VRAM, frustratingly stagnant from both the RTX 3090 and the RTX Titan from the 2000 series, but still lots for 3D rendering, VFX, AI art generation, and video editing workflows. Having been using this track of cards for my work for a few years now, I cannot express enough how much of a lifesaver this much VRAM actually is. So many failed projects and renders and effects for projects that I just couldn't do on the limited VRAM of, you know, my, my 1080, my 1080 Ti, and then the 2080 before that now soar on these cards, and they soar even higher on the 4090. I've been shooting video in 4.6K RAW on my Ursa since 2018, and this year I'm now shooting 8K RAW on my new Canon R5C. Using Puget Systems' Puget Bench benchmarks, Adobe Premiere Pro sees middling improvements in normal export and playback scores, because Premiere's playback is crap on any hardware, but the GPU and effects scores make a pretty substantial jump on the 4090, which means doing effects at this scale on these tier, you know, at these resolutions and the like, improves a lot. I edit everything in DaVinci Resolve these days, however, and the RTX 4090 sees significant score jumps across the board over the over both actually the RTX 3090 and the RTX Titan I had been editing on before. You can actually feel the improvement here, which is wild. Building a basic 4K video project with some GPU effects, transitions, stabilization, and different source codecs, the 4090 exports this project an entire minute faster than the 3090 which is insane at scale, but I, I wasn't satisfied with that benchmark. It was great, but I want to do better. So I moved the cards from my 12900K test bench to my Threadripper 3970WX workstation and built a super intense 8K video edit with color grading, face tracking, resolve super scale, upscaling for screen captures, and so on. The RTX 3060, 2080, and 3080 could not even handle exporting this video due to VRAM limitations. They it just caused plugins to air out and they just crashed. But the RTX 4090 exported the project eight minutes faster 
than the GPUs I was using before. Eight minutes. I cannot overstate the impact that these kinds of gains have on my workflow, especially now that I'm going to be creating content across eight channels next year. More on that in the coming months. NVIDIA's marketing for the 4090 included claims that it speeds up Resolve's Magic Mask object tracking. They're equivalent to the newer rotoscoping 2.0 and Adobe After Effects. But admittedly, I didn't see huge gains here. Tracking an object with object mask and my face using the face refinement effect, both of which use AI to track, from 8K video on a 4K timeline, I did see some improvements here, which will still save me, you know, a bunch of time as these tasks take quite a while and that time adds up over time, but maybe not as much in terms of speed up as I had hoped. Face tracking takes forever as is, so any seconds I can shave off is a win. If you're a high res or effect heavy video editor, the RTX 4090 is already going to save you hours of waiting and slower working right out of the gate. And we haven't even talked about actual like encoding speeds yet, though. That's coming. I'm also a photographer. It's one of my more personal arts as I don't publish a ton of my work, but it's something that I've loved ever since I was a kid and I still shoot both film and digital all the time. Back to Puget's benchmarks, Photoshop sees no real gains here. This is also the only test that AMD's RX 6600 actually scored well on somehow. I saw some comments uh, saying that I hid AMD from my ARC coverage that was mostly due to time and me only having this singular GPU to reference, but in 99% of the work benchmarks that I'm you know, focused on here, the RX 6600 isn't even worth considering. Photoshop is the, the lone exception. <laughs> Lightroom Classic work is a similar story. Decent scores, but don't buy a 4090 just for Photoshop or Lightroom. That being said, running Affinity Photo does see some pretty substantial gains on the 4090 here. It seems that just Affinity requires more GPU horsepower, and the 4090 soars a fair bit on it here. So, good stuff, I guess. I wish it ran on Intel, though, as I bet the A770 would score nicely here as well. AI upscaling is seemingly everywhere now, and something I've integrated pretty regularly into my workflow, just to keep things looking as best as I can in videos. The RTX 4090 tops the charts for the fastest upscaling in both Topaz Labs Video Enhanced AI and Gigapixel, as well as ON1 Resize AI 2022. But Topaz Labs' new Photo AI app still has the NVIDIA cards running pretty slow, with ARC still being the king in this app. Weird. What about all the other AI experiments that I get into? Using flow frames from Numcred to interpolate 60 FPS footage to 120 FPS for super slow-mo, the RTX 4090 sees a 20% speed up compared to last gen. Generating AI imagery using stable diffusion at half precision, the 4090 already blows away the other GPUs at all resolutions, but then at full precision, whew, no contest. More iterating, less waiting. Alongside my interest in AI art, which you can follow at my Analog Dreams channel, linked below by the way, I've also been getting into 3D rendering the past couple years. Uh, it started with me trying to learn Blender at the start of the pandemic, when things were a little too crazy to try to learn something so new so quickly, 3D scanning stuff on my iPad Pro, and then absolutely falling in love with the paradigm shift that Unreal Engine 5 has brought to pretty much everything. Game development, visual effects, filming, so many shows are using it now, and I've finally been poking around with NVIDIA Omniverse as well. I wish I'd started with all this stuff years ago, but holy balls is this world an amazing one, and I'm stoked to keep working with these kinds of tools. We already saw a general massive performance increase with UE5 with that Lyra game demo, which is basically like a little Unreal Tournament kind of third-person shooter here, but the numbers for actual 3D work tools are nothing short of incredible. I know, it's a meme whenever a new product from the likes of Apple or Nvidia claim to have twice the performance of last generation's hardware, and then that's rarely true, but like, it's f real, guys. Blender, the monster render benchmark scene, sees over 2x the rendering speed of the RTX 3090. Junk shop scene shows just under 2x the performance, and the classic classroom scene is back up over 2x performance jumps again. Two times faster. This translates not only to final renders, which at scale is absolutely massive, but much smoother creative processes, as all of the actual preview and viewport work you do will be more fluid and responsive, and you can more easily preview the final results without waiting hours and hours and hours. Going beyond that, benchmarking the Octane render used in Cinema 4D, Blender, Unity, and other 3D workflows again puts the RTX 4090 at just about 2x the performance, 
of the RTX 3090. Is the 3090 a paperweight by comparison? You can get it for a thousand bucks now, so that's compelling. The same goes for simulation work in V-Rate, however, seeing double the speed in both CUDA and RTX workflows over Ampere 2. I wish I had captured some of my reactions running these benchmarks. It's fun to be like, haha, twice the speed, yeah, okay, I believe you, Mr. GPU marketing man, but then to actually have so many real world workflows that I'm actually using turn out to be that fast, this is game changing. Like, I, f I feel weird being so hyped in this video, but it really is. For context, I've been building to this throughout the entire video. The Quadros, or the A card, A series cards, formerly known as the Quadros, that Nvidia sells to big studios for 3D, for art, for rendering, for video work, they cost a ton. The only GPUs we know about for Lovelace at the moment is the A6000, which costs five to six thousand dollars. Granted, the A6000 has 48 gigabytes of VRAM versus the 4090's 24. I would love to put that to work, but I don't think I'll ever be at a financial point where I can justify spending five to six grand on a freaking graphics card. Neither could many independent creators. It's expensive. I got to play with one, one of the Turing ones, back in 2020 or 2021, and yeah, it was real nice but the price is just plain inaccessible for many of us. That's what made the Titan RTX so appealing. Similar st stability, similar capabilities, a lot of VRAM at only $2,500, which was a great deal at the time. Now you can get an RTX 4090 for only $1,600 for the same performance as a, an equivalent Quadro, just with dual encoders instead of triple and not having unlimited encode sessions. This is the difference between being, you know, the card being something that a working creator could theoretically put on credit with minimal risk or save up for versus just being crap out of luck altogether. Like, either you can buy it even if you have to save up or you probably can never justify buying it. For people like me, the RTX 4090 is a fantastic deal. I don't just say that because Nvidia sent it to me for review. I paid $1,900 for my RTX 3090 and was able to justify it for similar reasons. And the 4090 delivers even more improved performance than the 3090 did over the RTX Titan. Plus, with the studio driver version that gets slower updates but more strictly validated and tested and all that stuff specifically for creative workflows, it works great in that regard. No. I don't think most people should buy an RTX 4090 for gaming, but I honestly think that was obvious from the price alone to begin with. Alas, that's just the consequence of Nvidia deciding to slap the GeForce label on it instead of keeping it in its own class of card. And of course, none of this accounts for the bizarre release that was the 3090 Ti last year. That thing should not have happened. I have much more expansive coverage coming for it, but we have to talk about recording and streaming on the 4090. These results are going to change everyone's workflows everyone who can afford one, and I don't think it will register how significant this is until more people actually have them and get to using it yourself and start realizing it. It seems like it's not a real thing, but it is. You see, Lovelace is Nvidia's first generation of graphics cards featuring hardware AV1 encoding. AV1 is a new open source video codec backed by a massive alliance of basically every company interested in video or streaming designed to bring higher quality video to your homes at a lower cost with lower bits and lower cost to the companies delivering it or passing it along. It's 100% the future of video, replacing H.264 after 15 or so years of domination and H.265's failure to launch due to patent and licensing issues because that company just wants everyone to pay them a ton of money. NVIDIA have brought back dual encoder chips for NVENC on these GPUs, which the Pascal 10 series cards had but really didn't leverage very well and are putting them to amazing use. There aren't any direct quality improvements to H. Actually, that's technically true, but the extra headroom allows for these GPUs to actually encode a really high quality preset, P7, that competes with X264 slower. It was available on Ampere and exposed in the StreamFX plugin for OBS, but couldn't really be run in real time on 30 series cards. Now it can. 264 here. Nvidia doesn't see a point in trying to put even more lipstick on a dying pig, but the individual encoders themselves are just insanely fast now, with the 4090's H.264 and H.265 encoders running laps around everyone else in both Handbrake and DaVinci Resolve. There is one exception here, that being AMD's RX 6600 that I tested. As I covered back during the RX 5700 XT's launch when I was covering it with Windle, AMD's H.265 encoder, mainly driven by their need to supply virtual desktop streaming to enterprise clients, is absurdly fast. 
blowing past even the 4090 by a wide margin. But its H.264 still isn't great. What all this translates to for the 4090 is faster exports and transcodes for video editors and social media sharing, of course. But it also means that you'll have less performance issues when recording or streaming while gaming on the same PC. This is huge. Using a quick game sample with Spider-Man from you know the, the new PC port, which is beautiful. More of these will come in the future videos. We do see mostly less of a performance hit on the 4090 while recording H.264 compared to previous GPUs, which is great to be expected. But when we switch to AV1 recording with the developer build of OBS Studio, holy balls, what? Even on the slowest, highest quality preset, which for H.264 last generation cards couldn't even do, the slowest, highest quality preset of AV1, AV1 has a mostly negligible performance impact. You lose about 10 FPS off your average, but the lows are unaffected, so performance is still smooth. Even better, once you're capturing in 4K or higher with H.264 and AV1, you get to use the dual encoder chips, helping make things even more smoother. I was able to upscale my 1440p gameplay to 4K within OBS in real time and record that at 4K60 and still have less of a performance impact than H.264 at 1440p. I could even upscale it to freaking 8K and using the P1 fastest preset, which still looks great, and have a silky smooth experience. 8K. This translates to the shadow play as well, where Lovelace GPUs can now record 8K at 60 FPS for the first time, leveraging HEVC, H.265, and up to 250 megabits per second bitrate, where I could play and record Splitgate in full 8K60 with no issues. This is game changing in almost every way. For workflows like mine, where I'm constantly needing maximum quality captures and often high res captures, this unlocks a lot of potential that I've been frustratingly bashing my head against the wall with the 3090. It also means outlets like our buds over at Digital Foundry will be able to keep capturing in high quality 8K or 4K 120 footage without issue soon. Quality wise, Nvidia's AV1 encoder just trades blows with Intel's back and forth, which means it's nothing revolutionary and Intel did a great job on theirs, but it's good enough for the first generation of AV1 encoders and I expect it to only improve as both we learn more about it and they tweak software and settings and all of that. Because all the software support for it pre-release here is very early and experimental right now. So there's obviously a lot they can change there. Anecdotally, they look about the same level of quality, you know, Intel, Intel versus Nvidia's AV1 encodes, with the only differences I consistently see being that Intel's encodes sometimes look like they have a little bit more contrast detail on really tiny small objects than Nvidia's, but that comes at the cost of there being more random like blotchiness of color change where there shouldn't be and Color's not looking right, whereas Nvidia keeps the colors consistency. Different approaches, but both solid results. The only issue I have, which I expect to be a short-term issue, is with 444 chroma subsampling. All streams and most footage that you record use 420 chroma subsampling, a form of color data compression to reduce the required bits in a way that no one, you know, most everyone is fine with and most people would never care about. But for punching in on tiny UI elements and screen captures when I'm doing tutorials or doing lossless pixel peeping like Bob from RetroRGB or the Digital Foundry Squad does, you want 444 so that quality doesn't get muddy when you zoom in. The difference between 420 and 444 is the difference of analyzing differences in image quality or graphics settings or just seeing artifacts that was added by the color co compression when you scale it up and making it hard to see the, harder to see the results properly. Or just cleaner upscaling in general if you need to upscale. Or better VFX results, better chroma keying. There, there's, there's a lot of uses. Based on conversations I've had, I believe 444 is actually supported by the AV1 encoder. And it's just a bug with the very early OBS development build that I was testing. So hopefully it will be fixed by the time they get it out for full release and I can test it again further. Capturing 444 4K 60 footage, even on my 3090 and my crazy NVMe RAID 0 array setup has still been a nightmare. And I truly believe that these AV1 encoders will be the fix to that. In the interim, I can work around this by upscaling the footage from 4K to 8K within OBS and kind of faking it to get the same results by downscaling it back down, but it's not ideal. The dual encoders speed things up by literally splitting the video feed in half horizontally, and one chip encodes the top half, the other chip encodes the bottom half, and then they stitch it back together. This differs from Intel's hyper encode that just kind of splits up the groups of frames into the different devices to encode them, which I actually found to not be all that useful when I was testing it for the ARC reviews. This does speed things up, but it does open up the possibility that you see a visible seam in the middle if you really zoom in 
on an 8K encode. But I've surprisingly not really seen any seams so far in my testing. I'll keep looking. All of the encoding talk I've just gone through will apply to all RTX 4000 cards, not just the 4090, by the way. Also, I want to point out that these GeForce RTX cards are still limited to three NVENC encode sessions. They quietly bumped it up from two to three last year, despite basically double the encoding headroom. This is tragic, especially now that so many people are going the multi-streaming route, and <laughs> you need a bunch more encode sessions for that to go to Twitch, YouTube, get the vertical feeds on TikTok and Reddit and all of that. You need more encode sessions for that, especially if you want highlights or anything else, and I hope they unlock it ASAP. The formerly Quadro A cards have unlimited sessions, and they actually have three encoder chips to slice things up three ways, which is an interesting note, I guess. This was a lot. And I didn't even get to cover gaming because due to a miscommunication that was mostly my fault, I only had half the time with the 4090 as most outlets. But we still got to look more closely at DLSS 3's frame generation and its impact on latency and FPS games and even more AV1 testing. Covering launches like this is no joke, especially when we're on week two or three of back-to-back -back launch cycles. We've, we had the ARC GPUs, the NVIDIA GPUs. Next week, we got 13th gen CPUs from Intel. With all of these streaming tests, I really start to wonder how we got to this point, where we can, you know, where we can just do all this from home so easily. Well, to answer that question, I'm working on my own documentary series about the history of streaming and content creation called Print Screen. That series will be made with the support of Curiosity Stream, a streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles, and will debut next month on Nebula, a streaming video platform built by and for independent creators like myself, Legal Eagle, Renee Ritchie, and Thomas Frank, among many others. Where Curiosity Stream is all about big budget nonfiction videos, we're building Nebula because we want a place for education e creators to put out, you know, to try out new content, put out new ideas that might not work on YouTube, especially stuff that might not, you know, might get demonetized, like a war-related series, or stuff that just takes a lot more budget than you'd get the ROI of for YouTube views, like a documentary series. Curiosity Stream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so they're offering my viewers free access to Nebula when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash epost. By signing up for Curiosity Stream, you'll get access to thousands of documentaries, like this one called Secret Life of Four, Five, Six-Year-Olds, which is especially interesting to me as my kid is not going to stop getting bigger anytime soon and there's a lot coming up very soon <laughs> by signing up to curiosity stream you will be helping not just me but the entire education community here on nebula as we work together to build a place where we can create content like print screen that would just be too much to you know normally juggle with youtube Plus, we have an exclusive bundle discount to get both sites together for just $14.79 for a year of content. That's 26% off their annual price. It's the best deal in streaming. Let me know what you want to see covered about this generation of graphic cards from any company, I guess, in the comments below. I'm your stream professor, and remember to be kind. Rewind.